Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? I am Sergeant Park of the 3rd Infantry Regiment, United States Army. Guard of honor, doom of the unknown soldier. The ceremony that you are about to witness is the changing of the guard. In keeping with the dignity of this ceremony, it is requested that everyone remain silent and stand. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention please? The ceremony that you are about to witness is an army replaying ceremony. To be laid in remembrance of former POWs, it is requested that everyone remain silent and standing during this ceremony. All military personnel in uniform will render the hand salute, and it is appropriate for all heavens to place their right hand over their heart upon the command of President Hawk. Thank you.
I told you about the uh, significance of the changing of the guard ceremony. We have uh, we have one of the uh, non-commissioned officers who's uh, in charge of the platoon of sentence, and that's Staff Sergeant Blackmore. And I asked him to spend a couple of minutes telling you about what it takes to become a sentinel and a little bit about their, their daily routine. I'm gonna ask you to challenge him if you have any questions about uh, about the program or anything else. So please, fire away. Tell, start and tell them a little bit about yourself as well. All right, sir, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I like, like the general said, I am a uh, Staff Sergeant Blackmore. I'm the relief commander for third relief. We're the relief that's on duty today. Our platoon is divided up into three reliefs. We're about 11 man sized uh, per relief, so about a squad size element per relief. And we're divided up by, by height to keep our ceremonial functions and duties outside. Uh, looking nice and smooth and even without having any breaks in height or continuity with uh, appearance out there. Uh, the whole point of the focus on the appearance that we put out there isn't for everybody that does come to view us. Uh, it is because our goal is always perfection. Our standard is uh, to remain at, at the level of perfection. So when we're out there, the, the work put into our uniforms, into our, uh, our craft with the ceremony outside, and into our own personal appearance, is to honor the unknowns uh, since they gave more than anybody had ever asked at all. Uh, the country oftentimes has asked, asked for soldiers, told people they were going to be soldiers, soldiers knew they were going to possibly die, but never once did anybody think that they were going to give up their identity for their country. Uh, so that is what we try to honor every day, and that is our platoon's mission, is to guard that honor out there. Uh, so to become a Sentinel, it takes quite a while, uh, uh, quite a bit of training. It takes anywhere from six to nine months to complete our training. Uh, we start at a very basic phase where they're going to learn uniforms, a little bit of the knowledge about our history, and they're going to learn the outside performance before they take the very first test. They'll have five tests total to be able to complete training. Not everybody does complete training though. So that the very first test, they'll be tested on those three items, and we're looking to see if they can be trained in what we do. Uh, if we think that they have what it takes to continue training, then we'll keep them in training, and then from there on, they'll have about another six, seven months before they're completed with training. The next four tests that come after that, they still encompass those same three target areas of uniforms, outside performance, and knowledge. Uh, by the time they are complete with training, they'll have memorized 17 pages of knowledge. Uh, the uniform, the ceremonial uniform that they wear outside, they're allowed to have two very minor deficiencies on it, which those could be anything from a stray piece of hair to uh, 1 64th of an inch measurement uh, for any of their, their medals, unit citations, stitching, anything that uh, we do to the uniform to modify it. Uh, the shoes themselves are leather. We sand those, we shine those. Uh, we keep those at a very high level as well. That's another area where we look for deficiencies. So by the time they complete that training, there's very minute things that they are looking for uh, in their uniforms with their outside performance. We stay to a cadence to perform our duties outside so that way everybody knows what and when everybody is doing something outside. The voice commands have to be steady and even. Uh, the rifle manual is set to certain angles uh, as put on somebody's body. So that way we can all know how somebody will look all the time, no matter who it is outside. Uh, so once they get tested on all of that, that then just uh, depends or sets the speed of their, their own training process. So the quicker they learn something, the quicker that we will test them on the next level. Uh, once they do complete training, then their job entirely changes and their whole focus is training the next group of soldiers and sentinels down here. Our job is just to keep the Guard of Honor alive. Our job is uh, not to be pretty for people or anything like that. We're not trying to put on a show out there like I had mentioned earlier. So it's about training the next group of soldiers to honor the end of this. Um, our daily schedule we have, we don't work, work off a normal schedule. We work a nine day schedule, we work a 26 hour day. Uh, we do that so that way then we have a nice smooth continuity of care of the unknowns. We have enough time to do our ceremonial duties outside during the day. And once the cemetery closes, we switch over into maintenance mode where we start taking care of our uniforms again. Every day we'll take apart our uniforms, we'll repress them, we'll reshine everything that's metal on them or that has polish on it. After we're done shining everything, then we'll start measuring, putting things back on our uniforms. Uh, if there is something that happened to our uniform during the day that damaged it, then we're going to take that uniform all the way apart, return it, get a new uniform, and start over from scratch. Uh, we'll do that every night, then we'll have a day off in between to continue working on those uniforms, and then we're back at work the next day. So every other day for five days, we're going to be working outside ceremonially. At the end of those five days, we will have four days where we're not here at work ceremonially, but we will have different work requirements. The first day after that, we're going to have our recovery day, so we're working on uniforms again. The day after that, we get together, we do PT, stay within regular Army regulations for physical fitness. 
Uh, our eighth day is an actual day off. It's our only day off during our work cycle. Our ninth day, we come back into the cemetery before it opens, and we practice, we rehearse, we make sure that we're at the same ceremonial level we were the week before, and that we didn't lose anything during that time. That's also where we put a lot more emphasis on training our junior, uh, newer soldiers, making sure that they can have the time they need to perfect their crafts, that way they can actually make it through training and continue training future Sentinels. So I said 632. I may have been off by a couple. What that number are you on? Uh, right now we're on 633, sir. How long is the tour of duty? Uh, it's normally around two years, sir. Uh, it, it's kept that way. We all come from the 3rd Infantry Regiment, which is our parent unit. It's just right on the other side of the wall of the cemetery. They're the ones who take care of all the, the memorial fairs around the uh, cemetery, and they also uh, encompass our other specialty platoons, like the U.S. Army Drill Team. Fife and Drum Corps, the Caisson Platoon, and things like that. Uh, so we come from them, we're one of the platoons in the regiment. Uh, about the time we get down here, we've already spent a year at the regiment uh, doing those memorial affairs or with one of the other platoons. So it usually only ends up being around two years that we have time to do down here, sir. I, I received a telephone call yesterday from Joe Clifford, who was a member of the 3rd Division and was a member of the Army Guard. And he went up and he knows the general, the uh, colonel, and uh, uh, he wanted to, to, to know how much we're going to have to do, to do this. And it was really a great honor. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You served us. Thank you, sir. Uh, it is a cemetery. We are here to guard the, the honor of the unknowns. Uh, loudness uh, is it, considered disrespectful. People talking to each other, I mean, we understand that people are going to say, you know, something small, short to each other, you know, this is what they're doing. As long as they're keeping it to a, a low volume and they're being respectful, they won't do anything. Uh, people having full conversations on cell phones, people joking, anything that would not be respectful in any cemetery or that we think is being disrespectful to the unknowns, uh, then we will come off of the mat. Uh, we will remind them that it is a place where they need to remain silent and respectful. Uh, once we do that, then we will step back onto the mat. Uh, if it was in the middle of us walking down the mat, we will walk to one of the ends of the mat, so that way it's not an interruption in our ceremonial walk along the mat. Uh, once we step back on the mat, uh, all, all the composure is regained. Uh, we do our 21 seconds of facing whichever direction is that we were facing prior to that, and then we continue on our, our guard walk from there, sir. And one of the, the rumors that has been with us for quite a while is that we do live here. We don't actually live down here. I myself live on, on Fort Belvoir. Uh, I'm married, not all of us uh, are single, not everyone is married. Uh, so we have our single guys that are lower enlisted, they do live in the barracks. Uh, if they are a, an NCO and they are single, then they do have the opportunity to live off post so they can live someplace else as well. Um, we do have a full set of quarters downstairs though. We have a, a kitchen, a uh, laundry room, we have a slop closet, we have a press shop, we have a gym. We do have a bunk room and a, and a shower room, and that's how we can sustain ourselves for those 26 hours. Uh, there are times during inclement weather during the winter where that 26 hours does get extended a little bit. Uh, we do need to be able to sustain ourselves. We do have all of that. By Jim, he means you need to think of the movie Rocky, Club Man. Okay, so well, here we have it's like a couple, of, rooms <laughs> it's like a couple of number 10 coffee cans with some met on them instead of, you know. <laughs> it's, that's what you need to think of, so. This is a place to work out. How long is the actual tour? Is the actual soldier walk? Uh, so in, the, in the summertime, we do a half an, half an hour walk. Uh, I'm sure, as you noticed out there, there's quite a few people. Uh, then we're going to change the guard, and it's just because there'd be so many people that would end up filling the stairs and everything like that. We wouldn't be able to get there. Uh, we wouldn't be able to control the volume and the level of respect that needs to be kept. So that's why we have the, the shorter walks during the summer. During the winter time, there are less people, so we extend that to an hour long, uh, just because there are less people. We don't have to worry so much about it becoming overcrowded, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. You were a little young walking around, too, the summit? Yes, sir. What was that? You were a wool uniform around the summit? Yes. So it's the same wool uniform that we wear in the winter, so it's, it's a little bit different than the polyester one that is store-bought. The, the pants and the top are wool. We do modify everything that we do wear uh, so we can handle the uh, the presses that we do put in it with the, uh, the extra lining in it. It couldn't quite press as tight as we want it to. Uh, so we do remove some of the stuff from the inside. We restitch certain areas, to lengthen other areas, and things like that. But it's always wool, sir. Hi. Yes, sir. Okay. General, thank you for the honor of inviting me here. It's something I never expected to receive, and not only in particular the honor of presenting the wreath 
but the honor that so many of you do for me. Sir, I, I, uh, I would like to say, to, uh, to say something here on, uh, I have a small token of appreciation for us at the Military District of Washington. Before I, before I give that, let's give uh, Staff Sergeant uh, Blackmore a hand. He and his troops get get a lot of honor and adulation, you know, for what they do. Uh, starting at eight o'clock in the morning when the public sees them, but but they're here every night at three o'clock in the morning too when nobody sees them, and they're doing the same thing. So you know, thanks for your service. Thanks for what you do. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Um, you know, of course, I I met you on uh, September. 10th or so, somewhere about somewhere there, about that time. in Boston, and uh, when we were up there for Spirit of America, and uh, you know, I, I've got to tell you, you're an inspiration for all of us. Thank you. Um, thanks for your service, but thanks for inspiring all of us. You know, the uh, the service of the World War II generation. I, I know that uh, the journalist. Tom Brokaw called it the, the greatest generation. And it's not, of course, limited to those who wore the uniform. It's also those who, who served at home and did many, many great things. But you planted the seeds for the Army that exists today. You really did. And, uh, and you know, you can walk around this place, this sacred place, and, uh, and see uh, the results of, of that service, not just in deeds of heroism, but walk out of the cemetery and go right over to Fort Myer, where the place that Staff Sergeant Blackmore was just talking about, and you can see the, the results, the fruits of your labor in, in what goes on in the Army today. Because you're gonna see uh, the values of the Army alive and well, and it's the Army you joined and you, the Army you helped build. And you know, there are key values, loyalty, duty, respect for others, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. We all learned, we learned those from you. Oh, so you helped build this army. And, and so it's a, uh, a small token of our appreciation that, uh, that we're gonna give you this uh, certificate and picture of the tomb and one of the sentinels walking in front of the tomb. Thanks for honoring us with your presence today uh, by laying a wreath. And I do have a, uh, somewhere in here, a small token of appreciation as well with one of my commander's oh. points. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I, I remember that, but uh, the, the patch. <laughs> yes, sir. But thank thanks, thanks for everything that you have done for us. Thanks for everything that you're going to continue to do. Oh, th thank you for the honor of having me. Thank you for the honor of having me here today. And I'm doubly honored that so many friends and family have taken their time out of their lives to spend the time down here in Washington with me. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> But it, it's an honor I never, never expected. And I'm very appreciative. Thank you very much. I, I would like to acknowledge one person here, and that's my POW advocate from the VA, Charlie Walsh, because if he hadn't spoken to Colonel Averill, uh, we wouldn't be here today. And he represents the VA, which has been wonderful for me since 1946. And I appreciate the VA, and more than appreciate the job that Charlie does for me. Yeah. And other bit POW. Here at Arlington National Cemetery at the Tomb of the Unknowns for the wreath dedication ceremony by Bob Noble and his family and Norfolk County District Attorney Michael Morrissey of Quincy has also stopped by to uh, pay special tribute to Bob during this uh, this ceremony. And Mike, what, what brings you here to uh, to the cemetery today? Well, I've known the Nobles almost 50 years and 
Um, I couldn't think of a more deserving person to have such an honor today. No one has really, people know around the, the city what he's done, and a lot of people probably didn't realize that he was a POW, he was the ex uh, chairman and president of the state POW chapter, and uh, he and his wife Gloria both have, uh, have always pitched in. You name the cause, and especially those that deal with veterans, but even the parade and, and uh, political campaigns, they're just uh, super people. So it was. Uh, Come down here and support Bob and all the work he's done. It's a good chance to recognize that. Is there any um, military service in your family at all, Mike? Uh, my grandfather was a World War I veteran. That's how the Morrissey's became U.S. citizens. Came over from Ireland, was brought up by his sisters, joined the U.S. Army, and I went to France with an artillery company, a disabled World War I veteran. They gave him his citizenship papers when he got out. My father, ironically, is a one of the youngest veterans of World War II you will find. He got in the service and upon graduation in 1947. The dates of conflict ended in December 31st, 1947. He is a World War II vet. It didn't go too far. He went in the same barracks that my grandfather was, cha uh, was trained in down in Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas, and he spent most of his time in Texas. What do you think uh, having Bob here uh, for this ceremony means for the city of Quincy? Well, it obviously has generated some, some buzz in the local media, which is good, but it, it's a good chance for people to reflect on military service in general. And particularly, you know, Bob was very fortunate. I think it was near the end of the war when he was captured in the Battle of the Bulge. A lot of people who lost their lives in prison camps and obviously lost their lives in battle. So it's a great chance to remind people we still have people over in, uh, in Afghanistan, Iraq, and, and uh, Kuwait and the Middle East right now that uh, stand at risk, you know, and they're fighting as well. So the fight continues. And then I hear the general suggest it wasn't people like Bob Noble who built the U.S. Army, you know, had those standards. and. The loyalty and uh, the same values that Bob had back in the 40s, I guess, uh, still alive and well, according to the general, you know, thanks to people like Bob. So if you could, Charlie, first tell us um, uh, your, your position here in Massachusetts and, and how it is you came to uh, uh, have Bob come here uh, to the ceremony. Okay, I'm the uh, ex-POW advocate for the Boston VA. And what I do in that capacity, among other things, is I take care of the remaining ex-POWs, there are only about a hundred left in Massachusetts today that use VA services. And I make sure that they have their appointments, they have their medicine, uh, any other needs, uh, any problems with benefits. Uh, and I run a PTSD group once a week, so we get together and we talk about whatever problems, or uh, just talk, just a therapy, supportive therapy type group. Tell us a bit about your service, if you could. Uh, I served in Germany from 1963 to 1966, and I uh, served in an area Bob knows well because he was a POW in that area. And I got to know the Germans, and I got to know the language a little bit. When I uh, came back uh, from the service, I went into private industry, but ultimately ended up working for the VA. And quite almost like this, uh, I attended a ex-POW meeting to do a relaxation group. Well, the guys loved it and kept inviting me back. Ultimately, I became the leader of the group, and I have done that for the past 17 or 18 years. I met Bob. Bob was the then MC. Bob would put every year, he was sort of a de facto leader, and he would do all the POWs from New England would get together at the Volpe Transportation Center and uh, they would have a ceremony honoring, remembering, commemorating all the lost POWs. So Bob and I went through that, and I took over organizing that event with Bob as the MC every year. We, over the years, certainly became close friends. Uh, he had asked me to attend a, a musical, The Spirit of America, which was going on in Boston, TD North. During that, that time, I went out for intimation and uh, I was schmoozing with the officers. I loved that. Uh, when we were in the military, the last thing you do is talk to a general or a colonel. So I happened to see the colonel here. And I started talking to her, schmoozing with her, just asking where she was stationed last. She's quite a celebrity herself. If you recall the picture of Saddam Hussein coming out of the spider hole, the colonel was the one that took it. So that was fascinating. And, uh, but. When I heard her combat experience, you have to meet Bob. And I brought Bob over. Uh, she felt, as I do about the POWs, these guys are great. So she says, you have to meet my boss. 
or her boss was none other than General Buchanan, who said, oh, you gotta come down for springtime. <laughs> so thus we ended up here. So it was uh, kind of an interesting uh, train of events. Would you call this one of the, the highlights in your service career? Of my, yes, yeah, certainly. Certainly, but uh, I cannot think of a greater honor for Bob or uh, a greater service because these guys came back, they were shamed. The culture in the 40s was one of John Wayne. If you didn't die with your boots on, you were no good. They would ask, what did you do? You saw the enemy and threw up your hands? And they felt that. They were young kids coming back. They were only in their 20s. And they suffered, so they packed away their uniforms, they stuffed away their feelings, and stayed very, very sick for over 40 years. PTSD wasn't even recognized until 1981 after Vietnam. And finally, they got together as a group and started talking about what's going on here? Why are we, you know, many of them became, like Bob, they became a workaholic. He still is to this day. But that's running from the feelings, too. And no place to put them. When they got together, they realized they were not alone. They were other people who experienced the same thing. Today, you know, it's a much greater, it's a much more recognized. And they're, they're dealing with the problems from Iraq and Afghanistan in a much nicer way than we ever, much more sophisticated way than we ever were able to before. We have tons of that going on. The Boston VA, all kinds of programs going on now to address that. You know, we're losing 22 soldiers a day. Basically, it's the same feelings that Bob experienced. You now, having to stuff that and not, you're a soldier. Well, they train you how to become a soldier. They don't train you how to become a civilian again. <laughs> so that's, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs>